Okay, this is our first lecture in our 2014 course on apologetics. Why I say that is because I've taught so many different apologetics courses over the years. That's the way we'll differentiate them now. And, um, and I start out first by arguing for the biblical basis for apologetics. Because there are people that are out there that don't believe we should do apologetics. We don't, don't believe we should... Uh, defend the faith. And you see there where it says, what is apologetics? Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia. And so apologetics is the defense um, of the Christian faith. Hey, don't it? And um, make sure you grab one of those books. So apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith. And it involves both uh, defending Christian truth, but also refuting uh, false beliefs. Now, uh, before we get into different ways uh, to defend the faith, uh, what I'm going to want you to do, uh, I'm going to be gone for a couple weeks, you know, we'll pick it up on November 30th, uh, but what I'm going to, just put your name on that, what I'm going to want you to do is I'm going to want you to look at Galatians 5, 22 to 23. So write that down. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Uh, against such things there is no law. So that's the fruit of the Spirit. But I'm going to want you to... Uh, Uh, I'm going to want you to, uh, we don't oh, you got that other one? Okay, I don't have one, so let me steal one. Oh, he's got one. Nope. We, we don't write any of these books, do we? Yeah, you can. They're, they're your books. Oh. And, uh, and so you can, you can write in them or whatever, but, uh, but Galatians 5, 22, 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. What I want you to do is to just write a little devotional for yourself. You could share it when we get back in two weeks. But, and I'll give you some reading to do from the textbooks, The Atheist Delusion and Hijacking the Historical Jesus. But um, I want you to look at the fruit of the Spirit and then see how that applies to apologetics, how we apply the fruit of the Spirit to apologetics. We don't get an exemption. It's just not like... Well, it is the fruit of the Spirit, so when you're feeding the hungry, make sure you have love, joy, peace, patience. But when you're doing apologetics, just rip their heads off, you know? It's not <laughs> like that. we got to still apply the fruit of the Spirit. So uh, some passages that will help you there will be 1 Peter 3.15. The sanctified Christ is Lord in your heart, so always being ready to make a defense of the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So you're having gentleness and reverence. And then Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Paul tells us to deal with wisdom towards those who are outside the church. Um, but he tells us to be gracious there. And, um, and, all, and, then, uh, and then in Ephesians 4, um, where Paul tells us to speak the truth in love. And so I just, I just want us to be <clears throat> reminding ourselves that as we do apologetics, we need to do it in Christian love. So that would be Ephesians 4. And uh, probably verses 14 and 15 will be good. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. And so I just want you to give some thought to that, that how, how we should defend the faith in light of our knowledge of the fruit of the Spirit, okay? And so that's going to entail being patient. So you might want to, you know, in your devotion, pray about it and all, and then write down, I, I need to be patient with people as I provide answers for them. You know, maybe, you know, I need to remember who I was before I came to Christ. Yeah, this guy is a egotistical jerk just like me before I came to Christ. So I need to be patient 
with that egotistical jerk because when I was an egotistical jerk, God was patient with me. He still loved me, and um, so hopefully that will uh, hopefully that will help you out a little bit there. But apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, and we have it right there in First Peter three fifteen, and. Uh, if you have your Bibles there, you can open up to that. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And that reads, But sanctify or set apart the Lord God in your hearts. So if you want to set apart the Lord, you know, Christ as Lord in your hearts, this is what you need to do. And always be ready to give a defense. That's the word apologia. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Uh, New American Standard says with gentleness and uh, reverence. So apologetics, what is it? It's the defense of the Christian faith. And to defend the faith, it's going to entail both defending Christian truth and refuting false beliefs. Now, if you look on the next page, it talks about different ways to defend the faith. And I, I am one of the few, well, I did my doctoral dissertation, but I did my PhD work, took me four years, on apologetic methodologies. And so the good news is I'm one of the experts on the different ways to defend the faith. The bad news is even most apologists don't really care much about apologetic methodologies. So I've only been asked to speak on the topic once at Western Reform Seminary. They brought me in to give 10 lectures on it. And... Um, but most guys classify the way to defend the faith as three, four, maybe five different ways. I classify them as 16 ways. 16 different ways. In fact, I think the best way to classify different ways to defend the faith is look at an individual apologist, an individual defender of the faith, see how he defends the faith. And so when you look at Norman Geiser, he says, well, say, well, he uses classical apologetics where he starts out with philosophical evidence for God, then he moves to historical evidence for Jesus, but he's also willing to do some scientific apologetics, give some scientific evidence for God, and even some cultural apologetics, where he talks about how bad things get if we turn our backs on the God of the Bible. So, uh, so I'm going to give you these different types. If you want, you can, uh, if you need to write down some notes on it, go ahead. Uh, but different ways to defend the faith, there's first the classical way. This is the way that the church has done it for the past 2,000 years. And I call it philosophical apologetics, but technically it's a one-two punch. You start with philosophical evidences for God, then after you establish the existence of God, then you move on to historical evidences. Whereas the evidentialist, the evidential approach, they usually just spend all their time on historical evidences. If they do argue for God's existence, they don't think you have to argue for God's existence first. Let me say this too. This is rather artificial um, because if a classical apologist loves the Lord and loves people, and if he finds, if he's witnessing to a Muslim, he's not going to go over arguments for God's existence because he knows the Muslim already believes that one creator God exists. So he's probably going to go right to historical evidences. That doesn't make him an evidentialist. It just shows that our apologetic system, the way we defend the faith in general, um, we care enough about people to where we're going to personalize that apologetic methodology for that particular person, okay? And uh, but the classical approach, 
Uh, so if you're writing a systematic theology and you throw in your apologetics in there, if you're a classical apologist, you argue first for God's existence and then you use historical evidences for God. I'm kind of a classical apologist, but I'm, I consider my approach a more humble approach where I'm just arguing for that belief in God is more reasonable than atheism. Uh, I believe that we can know that God exists with absolute certainty, um, but that's more, be, more because of my existential encounter with God. I, I know God exists because I personally know Him. Jesus walks with me. The Holy Spirit leads me, okay? Um, so for me to stop believing that God exists would be like somebody convincing me that my brother Mark never existed. You know, it's like, good luck with that. It's not going to happen because I've had a personal relationship with him. Um, uh, having said that, uh, I think you can make, you can prove God's existence. I think there's even ways to prove God's existence with logical necessity that God has to exist or we wouldn't exist. At the same time, I think you got to be more brilliant than I am to actually convince an atheist of that. So I take a more uh, mellow approach. But that's classical apologetics. Evidentialists will argue from historical evidences uh, for Jesus, and uh, they believe you could start there. The presuppositional approach is very unique. I love two things. I love presuppositional apologetics, but what I can't stand about it is the presuppositionalists believe you can only use their approach. If you don't use their approach, you're compromising the faith, you're, um, you're trusting in the wisdom of man, but the presuppositional approach, what separates it from, if you ever see me starting to write on this, stop me. That'll cost me my job right there. Cla the classical, what I'll call, I'll call it the traditional approach, which is both the classical and the evidential approach. That says you can argue from something to God. The presuppositional approach says no, you can only argue from God to something. So these guys, the presuppositionalist says you have to presuppose the existence of God and then argue from God. Now the problem with that approach, I think that there are ways to make it work. The problem with that approach is this, though. Um, if the person doesn't believe in God, and your first premise is that God, the triune God exists, and he revealed himself in the scriptures, if the person doesn't believe that, you've lost them already. Okay? Now keep in mind, the guys most likely to be presuppositionalists are five-point Calvinists. And the five-point Calvinist believes that either God regenerates you or he doesn't. So it's kind of like, I presuppose God, I'm going to start with God and then argue to something else. And, um, and then they believe if you don't start with God, you can't prove God's existence with total logical necessity. Uh, let me ask you this, though. If you're innocent of a crime and your defense attorney cannot prove that you're innocent with logical necessity, but he can prove um, that there's some good reasons to believe you're innocent, enough to win the case, is, isn't that good enough? You know what I'm saying? Just because I can't prove, because of my limited knowledge, just because I can't prove something with absolute certainty doesn't mean that what I'm arguing for is not absolutely certain. These guys really get get things uh, confused here. Um, they confuse the metaphysical status, the actual status of God existing with absolute certainty, with 
our knowledge or being able to prove that. And uh, so they argue from God to something. And, um, and I like some of their arguments, but to, to say that you can only argue my way and if you don't, you're carnal, you're ungodly or whatever, um, that's, that's problematic for me. Now Van Til had his own type of presuppositionalism and Gordon Clark had his own. And they both almost damned each other to hell. So when somebody says, yeah, I'm a presuppositionalist, well, I can identify at least three different types of presuppositionalists. And then there's a whole group of guys who think they're presuppositionalists and they're not. They're verificationalists. Okay? Now, having said that, I might be the only guy on the planet who believes that because of the research I've done. And um, I, I just find that too many, too many times we come up with five categories and then we take guys and try to force them. Well, he's this kind of problem. No, he doesn't fit there. They say, to act like, well, Van Til and Gordon Clark are both presuppositionalists. Well, they both hated each other's method of defending the faith. So uh, uh, the verificationalists, they, they presuppose the existence of God, but they use their assumption that God exists as a hypothesis that they open it up to testing. So in other words, they say, this is the way I interpret reality, I believe God exists, but let's test it. And that's what Francis Schaeffer did and C.S. Lewis did. So, um, so a verificationalist would be uh, somebody who's like doing scientific work where they're testing a hypothesis, an educated guess or whatever. So they, they handle, it's like they say, well, I believe the triune God who revealed himself in the scriptures is the explanation that explains everything else. But I'm willing to put that to the test. The presuppositionalists won't put it to the test. They just presuppose it, period. Okay? Um, comparative religious apologetics, that's like uh, Walter Martin, Hank Hennegraaff, uh, hmm. people who compare and contrast Christianity and other world religions and then give reasons why we should believe Christianity is true and the other religions are false, okay? Now, when you take some of these comparative religious apologists and try to force them into, well, he's a classical or a presuppositionalist, uh, it really doesn't make much sense. There's a lot of people that, that say they don't like apologetics. You just got to believe. You don't really present evidence for Christianity. Yet, they share their testimony to persuade other people to become Christians. Mm -hmm. These I classify as testimonial apologists, okay? So they don't even think they're apologists. Uh, the Apostle Paul could do pretty much just any one of these methods probably better than anybody alive. Yet when you put him up against uh, a ruler who's on trial, what does he do? He goes right to his testimony. So. Uh, let me say this too. Testimony of apologetics is probably, logically speaking, is probably the weakest way to defend the faith. Yet humans are so non-logical, it's probably the most effective way to defend the faith if your goal is to lead people to Christ. So um, I hate, I, I'll be honest with you, I totally hate sharing my testimony. Um, I actually believe, I actually think that as a non-believer, I think my life is exciting now that I'm a Christian, but I actually believe that I lived a boring life as a non-believer. Okay? Um, but I'm a good speaker. I'm a good preacher. I'm a good storyteller. So I can talk about a boring life in a way that sounds exciting to people. And so what happens when you share your testimony, the ending is always the same. You find Jesus, uh, he saves you, the Holy Spirit regenerates you, and then he transforms your life. So most people don't even care about the ending. All they want is the juicy, sinful part. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, when I share my testimony, I feel like, I feel dirty. I feel like people are, you know, am I exalting and glorifying sinfulness? Um, also, people are longing for celebrities. So if you're a good storyteller and you dress it up real well, you're telling the truth, you dress it up real well, then um, uh, it's a whole wow, I grew up in New Jersey and guys fight a lot in Essex County, New Jersey, and wow, that's so cool, he had mafia relatives or whatever. 
And um, so I actually hate sharing my testimony, but I have to admit there have been a few times when I, you know, prepared a 10-page speech to give, and I look at the crowd and I pray about it, and the Lord says, just put down your notes. That's dead work. That's going to burn up to share your testimony with them. And uh, as so I did that when I spoke in prison, at a prison, I just looked at the crowd and I thought, man, I got a good message prepared, but... Uh, these guys are really hurting, and I can tell it. I just, I just leave the letter, you know, and <clears throat> sometimes that's reassuring to prisoners when you tell them the difference between me and you. You got caught, I didn't. You know, growing up in New Jersey, I did a few, there were about at least three or four things I could think of where you could do prison time for. And, um, so, so, but that, but the way we think, oh, I'm better than them. No, you just never got caught. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, but testimonial part, it could be something, you know, you, you prayed, you cried out to God, and he answered your prayer. And, um, God has numerous times answered our, our prayers and, uh, uh, in ways that just go beyond natural explanation. That's testimonial apologetics. Uh, cumulative case. Apologetics, I like using this kind of a more of a classical apologist who uses cumulative case. That's where you say, you know what? I'm not the most brilliant guy on the earth. Plus, I don't know you too well. I don't know which one of my arguments is going to work. So I'm going to try to build a cumulative case. I'm going to give you lots of evidences for God's existence. And you might not like three or four, but then again, five or six might hit home. So I like using a cumulative case. And, uh, and that's what the cumulative case is, be a lot of different evidences. Uh, dialogical apologetics, David Clark spelled this out. It, it, uh, just think of dial a dialogue with somebody. He likes using cumulative case approach, a more humble use of classical apologetics, but it's real person-centered. So he really does a lot of praying that the Holy Spirit really shows him how to speak to the heart of the person that he's dialoguing with, okay? Um, he really tries, goes out of the way to try to, and, you know, the best way to do a dialogical approach, it's like, man, I don't even know this guy. How can I defend the faith in a way that'll speak to him, that could possibly speak to him? Uh, best way is just shut up and start asking questions. Just ask the guy quick. Let him tell you, and you'll learn a lot about him. You know, uh, Greg Kopel, a great apologist out of Southern California, in his book, Tactics, um, he, uh, he asks questions and when people about people's religious views. Because, see, nobody, two things you might want to jot down. We live in a day and age when nobody wants, nobody likes being preached at, okay? Until you become a Christian and then you want to go hear some good preaching, you don't want to be preached at. So Americans hate being preached at, okay? So that's number one. It's one of the reasons why I'm not a street preacher. And don't get me wrong, some guys are really good street preachers, but that's despite the fact that nobody likes to be preached at anymore in Western civilization, America and Europe. So nobody likes to be preached at. Um, but number two, uh, in our culture, everybody has an opinion about everything. Everybody has to has an opinion about every, everything, and they want to share their opinion. Okay? So if nobody wants to be preached at, and everybody has an, wants to share their opinion, probably the best way to dialogue with people is to ask them their opinion of things. You know, like... Um, yeah, you know something, uh, I was watching this ancient alien program the other night. What do, you, what do you think that stuff is? And then when they tell you, you say, well, how do you know that? You know, so those are good questions. Yeah, how do you know that? And um, uh, do you have, what makes you believe that? Do you have evidence for that view? And because what a lot of times what people will start doing, they'll start telling you their views, and when you ask them questions like that, they'll say, you know, I don't know why I believe that. I guess I, I guess I just do. 
Um, and um, uh, but just questioning people, and, and then what happens? You you do that, especially if you have more than one encounter with this person. They start asking you. Say, well, well, you seem like a really really sharp guy, and you're thinking, why would they think that? All I've done is ask questions. But you've exposed, you know, the holes in their armor, and they say, um, well, what are your religious views? Now, I've actually done this, and I've told people, I said, oh, you don't want to hear my religious views. Said, yes, I do. I want to hear. No, you don't. You, you're going to think I'm a narrow-minded bigot. No, I won't. You, you know, we're, we're friends. I just want to hear your religious views. Said, no, no, you'll think I'm, I'm an idiot. No, come on, share me. I said, you sure? You're not going to judge me? No. Okay. And then I start sharing the gospel message with them. And then they're like totally silent with their mouth hanging open because they're thinking he's a narrow-minded bigot, but they can't say it because they just promised not to call me a narrow-minded bigot. Another approach Frank Turk uses is the last question when they start talking about their opinion is you ask him, if what you believe wasn't true, would you want to know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that leaves them, they're going to say, well, no. Mm -hmm. Well, naturally they're going to say yes. Mm -hmm. So it opens the door, just like what you would do. You, you kind of lead them on. Frank's a, Frank's a good guy. Frank's a really yeah. sharp guy. And uh, got to spend some time with him in the, the November and stuff. And uh, went out to eat with him. And Jay, Jay Warner Wallace, mm -hmm. some real good buddies with him now. They, he's a really cool guy, too. Um, so it's dialogical apologetics, just really getting to know that person. Cultural apologetics is uh, kind of Francis Schaeffer did this a lot. Robbie Zacharias does this a lot. This is when you say, look, American culture was founded on biblical principles and God prospered us and made us the most prosperous and healthiest nation on earth, strongest nation on earth. And now that we're kicking God out of America, all of a sudden our health is going down the tubes. We've got violence. We, we're not quite winning our wars anymore. And this and that, things are getting bad. And so you, you kind of argue that uh, a culture that is obedient to God's moral laws uh, has a lot better present and future than a culture that disobeys God's moral laws. And it's kind of a way to make a really good defense of the faith. My depraved new world and death of Western civilization and death of man, those lectures are all cultural apologetics. Um, Okay, then psychological apologetics. This is really weird. Blaise Pascal was a psychological apologist. Psychological apologetics um, deals with the psychological makeup of man. So it deals more with the feelings of the person and the will of the person rather than the reason of the person. Okay? So you're dealing with things like meaning. Is... If God doesn't exist, is life meaningful? If after you die, you're going to cease to exist, and does it really make a difference whether you live your life like Adolf Hitler, where you slaughter innocent people, or like Corey Ten Boom, where you risk your life to save innocent Jewish people? Uh, what difference does it make? So like the absurdity of life, life uh, without God, um, also man's thirst for God. You can go in the writings of atheists, and see in their really honest moments that they acknowledge that that they thirst for something more than this world has to offer. In fact, Blaise Pascal, probably the greatest psychological apologist who ever lived, said the only good thing in this world is the hope of another world. And um, so it's kind of like the problem of evil. How could God allow all this injustice? Well, let's put eternity hell for those who oppose God, heaven for those who trust in Jesus. Let's put eternity at the end of this rotten 70 or 80 world years of existence and things do balance out. And um, um, But that's psychological apologetics. Scientific apologetics is when you take uh, scientific evidences and you argue for the existence of God the universe had a beginning. Virtually all scientists acknowledge that. Well, whatever has a beginning needs a cause. 
okay? So there had to be some cause for the beginning of the universe. And by the way, if all of the universe needs a cause, you run out of natural causes. So whatever caused the universe to begin to exist, by definition, has to be a supernatural cause. So the universe needs a supernatural cause. You see the tremendous complexity and design in the world. The cause of the universe must be an intelligent designer. And if morality is real, if it really is evil to torture innocent babies, if that really is evil for all people at all times and all places, then there has to be a moral law here. So uh, the cause of the universe must be a moral being and an intelligent being. Um, um, and, uh, but whatever the case with scientific apologetics, you're really dealing on the argument for design and the argument for the beginning of the universe. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, reformed epistemology or God's existence as a properly basic belief. This is from Alvin Plantinga, one of the world's leading philosophers. And he basically, he, epistemology is just a word for, uh, a philosophical word for knowledge. And um, reformed means he's from the Calvinist school of thought. But, but Alvin Plantinga just says basically, um, who says you have to have evidence for believing in God? And it's amazing how many of the world's leading atheist philosophers get totally blown away by that statement. You know, the atheist says, you know, planning it when he did one of his debates with two of the world's leading atheists, uh, he's had his arms folded, and they kept the Anthony Flew, who later on be believed that God existed, but during this debate he was an atheist, he said, some evidence, all I want is some evidence, give me some evidence. And planning this says, why? Who says I need to give you evidence? And he just went through the whole debate like that. And so what he basically says is that, look, if your elderly grandmother believes in God but can't prove God's existence, that doesn't mean that she's not justified in believing in God. And, and he's a philosopher. Planning is a philosopher, so he tells his philosophical colleagues, you guys just know as well as I do that our belief in the existence of other minds besides our own is really a belief we hold to without any evidence. It's not like we say, well, I really need to talk, you know, we don't say, I really need to talk to Pat and to Kyle and to Jeff and to other people to see if there's other minds. No, just the fact that I'm going to talk to Pat, I'm going to talk to Kyle, and I'm going to talk to Jeff means I already presuppose the existence of other minds. So the existence of the self, philosophers don't really argue for that. They just assume it. The existence in the, the, uh, uh, of other minds, the basic reliability of sense perception, that our senses are giving us real knowledge, uh, the existence of a physical world outside of our minds, all these things are just taken as kind of self-evident. They're just properly basic beliefs. And so what Alvin Plantinga says is, who says that God is not one of those properly basic beliefs? So if your elderly grandmother, you say, well, Grandma, why do you believe that God exists? So well, I just know he exists. Alvin Plantinga's response is, Grandma, that's a good response. Because I get that all, that all the time from my philosophical colleagues about the existence of other things. Uh, why can't God be a properly basic belief? Now, what he does there though, he doesn't throw out classical apologetics. He says you can still use the traditional arguments for God because some people need some extra help and you can find, maybe use them as clues for God's existence. However, he won't just argue from like the cosmological argument for God's existence, the argument for God's existence that Everything that has a beginning needs a cause. The universe had a beginning, therefore the universe needs a cause. He'll also use as a clue a beautiful sunset. And say, wow, God exists. And his atheist friend says, I don't see it. And he says, well, it's properly basic for me. You know, I see a beautiful sunset. It's a no-brainer, God exists. 
You know, it's like King David, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So what I like about planning, though, he doesn't throw out the other approaches. Uh, narrative apologetics, that's when you say, you know what? These guys are so anti-God and anti-Christian, they're not going to listen to me. As soon as I start talking about God, they're not going to listen to me. But they like reading stories. So C.S. Lewis says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write the Chronicles of Narnia. Hmm. Or the screw tape letters. Tolkien says, I'm going to write the Lord of the Rings. Um, Dostoevsky says, I'm going to write the Brothers Karamazov. And what you do is you, you write narratives, you write stories, you write novels. And people who won't read Christian philosophical or theological works will read these novels. And in a sense, you could tell narratives through films. And you can make a movie that might attract people who wouldn't listen, wouldn't attend a debate, but in watching this movie, it starts chipping away at their hardened hearts. Okay? And so that's narrative apologetics. I think it's more than just evangelistic we're sharing the gospel, but I think it has a persuasive element where it may even uh, help lead people to Christ. And then combinationalism, you know, cumulative case, you might use different arguments for God, different evidences for God. Cumulative case, you might use different evidences for Jesus' resurrection. But combinational means your whole approach, you just decide, I'm going to be eclectic. I'm going to borrow some of the classical arguments. I'm going to borrow some arguments from the presuppositionalists. I'm going to borrow some arguments from the testimonial apologists. Uh, by the way, with testimonial apologetics, you know, you get guys who, like my old professor Barry Leventhal, who got saved out of Judaism because Hal Lindsey shared with him the Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus. Hal Lindsey got him to admit he was going to UCLA. He was one of, the cat, one of the captains on the UCLA football team in the early 60s. And Barry, he got Barry Leventhal to admit, you make a strong case that Jesus fulfilled these Old Testament prophecies from your Bible. But when I go back to my dorm, I'm going to read my English translation of the Hebrew Old Testament that we Jews use. And I'm sure these verses are all going to be different. And he went back and they weren't. Okay, and, um, and, um, and then you get people like uh, Abdu Murray, who is a Middle Eastern Muslim who converted to Christianity. So, you know, you get guys converting from another religion to Christianity. It's a powerful testimony. But combinationalism says, man, you know, I'm kind of combinationalist. It's like, man, I haven't heard any, any argument or approach or methodology that I don't like. And you take you take and borrow from each of them. There's just some pictures there for you to look at some of the mugs of these guys. There's Blaise Pascal, who looks like a pinky with long hair. Probably why he died at the age of 39. <laughs> if if Blaise Pascal lived to be 89, he would probably be having these lectures on Mars right now, because the guy was th th that dude was that brilliant. Okay, but Blaise Pascal, maybe we'll get to talk a little bit about his wager argument for God. Um, got a chapter on him in my seven great apologist. Um, if you want a copy of that, let Pat know. He's got <laughs> plenty of them. Sure. C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer were two verificational apologists. Um, Schaeffer was a Calvinist. Uh, C.S. Lewis was more of an Arminian, uh, yet they both used the same basic approach. Uh, they just often describe Christianity as like finding the key that unlocks the door so that everything makes sense. Or, or Schaefer said, it's like finding that missing piece from the jigsaw puzzle that once you put it there, the whole jigsaw puzzle comes to life and you realize what it actually was, okay? Um, Ravi Zacharias is a classical apologist, but he's also a cultural apologist and probably has, you know, ideas have consequences and Ravi Zacharias has managed to Um, he has uh, managed to, to show how bleak, how 
anti-Christian and non-Christian philosophical ideas, how dangerous they are and how much damage they're doing to uh, Western civilization. And so he's kind of, I see him as, as kind of on culture, because both uh, C.S. Lewis and Schaefer also did cultural apologetics. I see them as passing the baton on to him. And Ravi Zacharias, you know, he's got, he's from, his family's from India, though he was raised in Canada. So he's got the Indian accent. And just hearing the Indian accent proclaiming Jesus as Savior is powerful in itself. He uses silence. You know, a lot of guys are going to take turns preaching on Sunday evening. Let me tell you, if you fill every second with words and you never use silence, you will close the door on the Holy Spirit in a few times when he really wants to do his work. Ravi Zacharias uses silence better than anybody. Now, I, I don't mean to be prideful. I'm just telling it like it is. At most, making a general statement, at most apologetics conferences that I speak at, I'm not a famous guy, but when I speak with the famous guys, I usually do pretty well because there's a general rule that usually works. One is, if the other speakers know more than me, I'm probably a way better speaker than they are. Okay? And then if a guy's a better speaker than I am, he usually doesn't know as much as me. So I've got a pretty good balance to where I usually speak at these conferences and people are either, you know, they usually it's like, wow, man, that guy's a good speaker. Where, who is this guy? Where is he from? Uh, or, um, if there's other guys that speak better than me, I usually know more than, wow, this Franz guy is brilliant. Where did he come from? So I got a good balance of both. Let me tell you, when Ravi Zacharias is talking, I shut my mouth and I take notes. Because this dude whoops me big time in both categories. I can't speak like he speaks. I mean, this guy on the radio, I'll be driving in my car, and I'm sensing the presence of God and the hair standing up on the back of my neck, and I'm feeling like he's bringing me into God's throne room. It's one thing to do to do that in public, but when a guy's doing that over the radio, okay, and when he's silent, it's like, he stopped talking. Why did he stop talking? Then you just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. What did he just say? And you think about what he just said. What's so big about that? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait, and the Holy Spirit just does his work. And um, But Ravi Zacharias, man, he's a godly man, and... Um, uh, William Lane Craig. Uh, by the way, I never met Ravi Zacharias. I, I never met Schaefer, died in 84. C.S. Lewis, who died in, in uh, 63, the same day Ken, James, uh, that uh, JFK died. And um, uh, contrary to popular belief, I never met Blaise Pascal, died in the, 16, <laughs> died in the 1600s, so I was just, just a little guy back then. But I, I met William Lane Craig in fellowship with a brilliant guy. Hey, it's amazing when you meet with these brilliant Christian apologists and philosophers that they are Christians first and brilliant philosophers second. So when I didn't see William Lane Craig for five years, the next time I saw him, first thing out of his mouth was, uh, how's your wife Kathy uh, doing? And I've been praying for her back. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even remember telling him him about her back pain and stuff. Gordon Clark and Cornelius Van Til, I studied their thought. They've got chapters on them and seven great apologists as well. And they were the presuppositions. They would freak out if they saw their pictures together on the same page because they Van Til uh, blocked Clark's ordination. So when it came time to get him ordained, he blocked it. And they wrote against each other. They debated each other. and Oh, it was vicious. Uh, Van Til uh, chewed out Schaefer because Schaefer amended Van Til's approach. You don't amend Van Til's approach. Um, um, but they died in 84 and 85, I think. Uh, so and I didn't get to meet them. But Gary Habermas is my old professor from Liberty University. He's an evidential apologist, good friend of mine. And, um, and now Norman Geisler, a classical apologist. I'm, Becoming really good friends with him, who's also one of my professors. He wants me to, uh, he asked me to contribute a chapter to his next book, which is a real, real honor. Guys was like 82 years old, 83, 84, so you want to catch him while he's still with us. Uh, Walter Martin, only met him once. 
and uh, just went to hear him speak, but never never got to talk to him personally. But he was from the New York, New Jersey area, who's an original Bible answer man, and he did comparative religious apologetics. Um, you want to be, you want to learn about the cults, the non-Christian cults. Uh, you got to read his "The Kingdom of the Cults," outstanding book. Now his daughter just took his transcribed sermons uh, and lectures and put together the Kingdom of the Occult, which is also really good. Uh, then there's Henry Morris, a great uh, young earth creation scientist. Never got to meet him, but I met his right-hand man while he was still alive, Dwayne Gish. He was in his late 80s, and he has shrunk over the years. So I found out that the dude was like, you know, only five foot five and a half, and this guy was down below my chin. So I got lots of pictures taken. When I spoke at a conference he was speaking at, I made sure we took lots of pictures because they made me look like a giant. And uh, uh, But Henry Morris, a great scientific apologist, a young earth crazy, had his PhD in hydraulic um, science, so the study of water. So he was, he was the perfect guy to study the global flood and write on it. His, his book, The Genesis Record, and the Genesis Flood are two classics, but my favorite book of his is Many Infallible Proofs. Um, so, um, so those are different ways to defend the faith, but if we're going to argue that we, we should defend the faith and uh, that we're right to defend the faith, we have to respond to the fideist. So let's do that right now, uh, response to fideism. Fideism is the belief that Christianity should merely be believed and not defended. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard was a famous Danish philosopher and a famous fideist. He argued that our subjective beliefs are much more important than the objective truth. Now there's, there's a, an aspect of his thought that is right on, and that is what good is it to you? What good is it to anyone in this room if Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead if you don't personally believe in that and believe in him? So if you don't trust in Jesus, it's not going to do you any good. If I don't trust in Jesus, it's not going to do me any good that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. But that doesn't mean that it's irrelevant whether he really died and rose. All that matters is that you subjectively believe in it. Now keep in mind, Kierkegaard was responding to dead orthodoxy where people recited creeds and had the head knowledge and then they lived the, from Sunday night to the next Sunday morning like non-believers lived. And so it's like Francis Schaeffer, Francis Schaeffer, argued that true Christianity or true spirituality, which is Christianity, equals propositional truth plus personal encounter or personal relationship. Okay? So, the people of Kierkegaard's day and Europe acted like Christianity, true Christianity, is only propositional truth. All that matters is that you recite and believe the right creed and you have head knowledge. Okay? Kierkegaard argued that it's not true spirituality unless you have, um, until you personally encountered God and personally experienced God, enter into a personal relation with, with Him, you're not really a true believer. Uh, now, I don't know if he was stating it this alone because that's what he really believed or if he just understood that if I'm going to bring the pendulum to the center, I need to argue for the opposite extreme. I don't know. Now, he did most of his writings, he used a pseudonym, a false name, so he might have really believed more in the center. So I don't know if he was a true believer or not. There are philosophers like Christian philosophers like R.C. Sproul who believe he was a true believer. But he's at least acting like all you need is that subjective belief. The 
act of the will, okay? Um, I think Thomas Aquinas was right. We need belief that God exists and Jesus is Savior. Belief that. But then we have to go to the act of the will and believe in Jesus to be saved. Okay? And so what the Phidias is doing, he's acting like it's only down here. Okay? It doesn't... And so, whereas the biblical concept of faith, a lot of you ask the person, what is faith? Richard Dawkins believes that faith and reason never meet. If you have reasons and evidence for your views, then it's no longer faith, it's knowledge. Um, and so he believes faith and reason can never... So if you can defend God's existence, it's no longer faith. Okay? The biblical view of faith is that faith is based on the evidence. Okay? And the unfortunate thing with the American church today is that most Christians and many pastors have the Kierkegaardian view, the false view of faith, where they actually believe that faith goes against reason. Okay, and they give illustrations for faith. Uh, you fall off a cliff, you grab on a branch, you're hanging from the branch, and a voice from the top of the cliff, you can't see it, and the voice says, let go. You say, well, who are you? I'm Jesus, I'll save you. But you just have to let go and trust in me. Let me tell you something, you're an idiot if you let go, okay? Number one, you haven't seen the guy. Number two, if you see the guy and he looks like Jesus, hey, I just ran into 20 guys today that look like Jesus. They got the long hair, the beard, and mustache, okay? Uh, my Bible doesn't tell me to let go there, okay? Now... Evidence-based faith, and I still, but I, you know, it doesn't mean you have to exercise it because I won't. But a guy walks across a canyon on a tightrope, and he says, "Do you believe that I can walk across this tightrope with a wheelbarrow with 200 pounds in it?" And I say, "Yes." And he puts 200 pounds of sandbags on it, and he walks across. And he says, now that you believe I can go across with 200 pounds in a wheelbarrow, I want you to get in the wheelbarrow and walk across. Okay, if I believe in him there, it's, you know, evidence-based, especially if I say, yeah, but my weight's not as proportioned as those that said, don't worry, it wasn't proportioned the way I set it up, and this and that. If I get in that wheelbarrow, that's a faith based on evidence, but my, I myself, I, I still have too much confidence in Murphy's Law. But that's a better illustration than the hanging off the tree. Another thing is, uh, you got everybody in this room is exercising a tremendous amount of faith right now. Okay? Especially me, I got a back problem, a lot of it's right near the tailbone, and we're exercising faith in man's technology, man's ability to build things called chairs, little structures that will suspend a human a couple feet above the ground. If you just free fall right from where you are, you could end up, if it's possible, you could get paralyzed. You could, it's going to hurt at the very least. But you're comfortably sitting there because you exercise faith in man's ability to build chairs that sustain our weight. Okay? Now, we exercise even more faith in man's technology when we drive over, like, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, okay? Especially if you've seen the old footage <coughs> of the first attempt to build that bridge, swaying in the wind, and then it goes down. Um, I, when they built the new one, I figured I'm going to wait two weeks before I drive over it. I want to make sure. I don't want to be that first guy, you know. Okay, you, you paid the toll, now you can go across and say, okay, oh, by the way, you're the first guy that... It's like, man, I'm going to pull over to the side of the road and let on your guys go by first. I'm not going to be the first guy um, to check it out. Uh, but when we drive over a cement slab, a bridge, hundreds of feet suspended over water that's really, really deep, and it doesn't really matter how deep it is because it's just going to be as hard as concrete if you fall that far and land on it. So... Um, that's a tremendous amount of faith. And I, I'll, I'll be, you know, 
because I've studied evolution and I've seen how scientists are just humans and they can make lots of mistakes, I don't have as much faith in man's technology as other people. So when I drive over the new Tacoma Narrow Bridge, first thing that catches my eye is it doesn't look identical to the other bridge. The, you know, if I'm going towards Tacoma, it's like, okay, why does it look different? It's like, oh, I know, they probably found a way to make this one more secure than the other one. So I feel good right now, but I thought, wait a minute, if that's the case, I'm not going to feel real good coming back. Because what's wrong with the other one that they needed to correct on this one? And then I think, well, wait a minute, maybe they didn't correct something. Maybe they cut a few corners and found out a way to save money. Maybe this one's not it. So it's just like, you know what? Don't even think about it. Just drive across this thing. And, um, uh, but it's amazing how much faith we put in man's uh, uh, technology. Um, but uh, I got to go for my first, I've done an MRI before, but it's the first time they put me in a tube. And I'm claustrophobic. So I'm terrified. Now they say they're going to medicate me. I hope they really, really medicate me because I don't think, they say it's only 20 minutes because there's just one part of my back I've got to look at. But I'm terrified about going in there and I'm thinking, look, look, you just, you just got to, you know, sing praise songs or something, quote memorization verses, it's only 20 minutes and it's like, what if it goes longer? What if they have complications and it goes longer? You know? Close your eyes and take them out. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm, I'm hoping the medication is sleep medication. And then I'm thinking, what if the power goes out? Then I thought, well, they got to have a backup generator. But does it get turned on immediately? Or is there like an hour delay? Uh, and then I thought, what if there's an earthquake? I'm dead. You know, so it's like, um, you know, what if the medication wears off while I'm in there? You know, so we can have some like irrational fears. Um, but what the Phidias is saying when it comes to faith, Faith is more like your irrational fears than it is like trusting in something because you have good evidence for it. That's not the, the biblical view of faith, okay? Um, when Jesus told Doubting Thomas, Doubting Thomas said that he didn't believe the apostles. No, I'll only believe if I see him and if I put my hands in his wounds. So then Jesus appears to him eight days later and down in Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, oh, now you see me and you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. So the Phidias says, see, that's blind faith. No, it's not blind faith. What Jesus is saying is, look, you know, like that people say seeing is believing. There's some people who will not believe. Uh, I saw a scientist interviewed on television who uh, refuses to believe in the existence of giant human races because he hasn't seen a bone. He hasn't held a bone in his hand, okay? And that's the way scientists are. But we have between, you know, we have over a thousand eyewitness testimonies of giant skeletons in America alone from the 1870s to the 1920s or the 1930s. See, what this guy's saying is empirical evidence Seeing is believing. Empirical evidence holds more weight um, than, my, than um, eyewitness testimony. And so my theories like evolution based on circumstantial evidence hold more weight than eyewitness testimony. Not in the court of law. Court of law, eyewitness testimony holds a lot more weight than circumstantial evidence. So, um, um, so there's a lot of people messing with, with things. So what Jesus is slamming down to Thomas is he's saying, hey, look, you had eyewitness testimony from reliable eyewitnesses, guys you personally knew. That's enough to believe. Blessed are those, like 21st century Christians, who believe without seeing and believe based on solid eyewitness testimony, knowing that the apostles were sincere enough in their beliefs to die for their beliefs. And what did they believe? They believed they saw him risen from the dead on numerous occasions. And so it's not, Jesus is not promoting blind faith, but he's, what he's saying is, 
what, where he's ticked off at Thomas is the amount of evidence he was demanding, not the fact that he was demanding evidence at all. Okay? Um, look at Hebrews 11. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so they act like, see, God is all for um, blind faith. Um, anybody have the NIV there? The NIV does a real good job breaking down what this means. Not quite as literal. The NIV, uh, uh, the NIV really, really makes it clear. But it's basically just saying, look, faith is trusting that you have something that that you hoped for, and uh, it's accepting the evidence. Of things not seen. In other words, in other words, faith in the whole context here, faith is trusting that God will keep His promises even if you die without receiving those promises. That's the whole context uh, of faith, the whole meaning of faith in, the, in chapter eleven. So what you have to understand, faith is Abraham being too old to have kids and his wife being barren, but God promised him they will have a son. And from that son will come a mighty nation, God's chosen nation. And so faith is believing in God and his promises. Well, do we have good evidence to believe God's promises? Abraham had a hard time believing God. said, look at the stars. If you can count them, you'll be able to count your descendants. I tend to think the text doesn't say, but when he looked at the stars, he probably thought, wait a minute. The one who made that promise is the one who made those stars. If he can make those stars... He can bring life to my wife's barren womb and fulfill his promise to give me a son and to raise up a mighty nation, his chosen nation. Um, Abraham would have been an idiot not to believe God. So faith in God, um, God gives us evidence to believe, both in nature and then supernaturally through miracles and so the idea that faith and reason never meet, when Richard Dawkins said that in a debate with John Lennox, another Oxford scholar, he said that faith and reason never meet. Uh, John Lennox, and I, I can't imitate him too well, but he said, he was leaning on a podium, he said, well, now surely, Richard, you must have good reasons, so you must have good reasons to have faith in your wife. And Richard Dawkins said, of course I do. And the whole audience started laughing. The only guy who didn't understand that Dawkins' view was just refuted was Dawkins himself. Because what he said was, I have good reasons, good evidence to have faith in my wife. Faith and reason are not totally separate. Um, you can have a rational faith. And that's the kind of faith that uh, the Bible encourages. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And we're wrapping things up right now. 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 3 to 8. Um, Paul says this, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And what he does there is he shares an ancient creed or hymn that was recited or sung in the early church uh, in the early 30s A.D. Um, some would put this within three. Some would even put this within one year of the crucifixion. So an ancient creed, this is the earliest Christianity that was proclaimed, the earliest gospel that was proclaimed, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, that's the Aramaic name of Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some had fallen, as, fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then Paul adds to this ancient creed, then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Does that sound like he's, he's encouraging a blind faith? No. He's saying we believe because we saw him alive after his death on numerous occasions. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. So he's saying your subjective inward belief 
doesn't amount to a hill of beans, it's worthless unless what you believe in is objectively or outwardly true. Verse 17, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. And so what Paul is saying is our faith has to be based on what really occurred in history. Our faith has to be based on the evidence uh, or it's worthless. And so, um, and so that's our initial response to fideism. Um, our, our fuller response to fideism will be our next lecture, and that's the biblical basis for traditional apologetics. We're going to see that the Bible commands us to defend the faith. So how can we be fideous and say you just have to believe? You don't defend the faith. The Bible commands us to defend the faith. And then the Bible speaks of God revealing himself to us through nature. The Bible speaks of uh, eyewitness testimony and historical evidences uh, for Jesus. And then the early church defended the faith. And so what we find is that the Bible teaches us to defend the faith. Okay? And um, so we'll talk about that uh, our next time together. We're going to take off next Sunday and come back the Sunday after, and we'll deal with that. So if you could put a, a bookmark uh, in there on that page uh, in your notes, and then we'll pick it up there next week. Now, um, for your reading, so work on a little devotion, just a few sentences on the fruit of the Spirit, and then those verses on apologetics. Uh, how can I manifest the fruit of the Spirit, not just in my everyday life, but in my apologetics as well? And we're probably going to all come up with different answers, but it will just get us thinking about, okay, I need to defend the faith, but I need to be gentle and respectful <clears throat> with others. And I'll tell you, it's not easy. You ask a guy, well, what do you believe about how we got here? Uh, we live in funny times. So if the guy, well, I believe, you know, that, uh, that aliens from other planets came and, um, and seeded the planet with life and primitive life form, and we evolved from that, and, the, and you might think, well, I'm going to laugh. Hey, Watson and Crick once held that view. And they won the Nobel Prize for cracking the genetic code. But sometimes it's hard not to laugh when we hear people's weird views. And, um, but we got, we got to be gentle and respectful. And so, so work on that. And then um, um, I'll look at the, uh, the atheist illusion. We're not going to get into the hijacking of the historical Jesus until we get into historical evidence. So that's going to come a lot later. Um, let me just borrow, or I can get one right here. Let me take a look and, and see what chapters would set us up here. Now this is uh, The Atheist Delusion, A Christian Response to Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins. It's, uh, it's refuting the new militant atheism. And so I, I would say if you just read the first two chapters of that, that would get you off to a good start. The new militant atheism, what they're all about, what makes them new, what's new about them. It's nothing, no new arguments. It's just, it, what, the new... Atheism, what it basically is, they're like, look, we've disproven God over 150 years ago, and we gave these people enough time to get rid of that superstitious belief that's leading to all the world's problems. If they're not through it now, we're losing our patience, we need to do something about this. So what makes the new atheism new atheism is their militant attitude to where, like Richard Dawkins classifies teaching children about God as child abuse. And, well, you know, he wants to see child abusers locked up. So what is he saying about Christianity? You know, I'm not an idiot. I'm not an idiot. He's saying, he don't want to come right out and say it, but he wants us locked up. And so what makes the new militant, uh, the new atheism new, is the lack of patience that they have. It's like, we need to be done with these guys. Uh, Christopher Hitchens write, writes a book, God is Not Great, and he subtitles it, How Religion Poisons Everything. Now, he said how false religion, 
which includes atheism, poisons everything. I'm in agreement with that. Um, uh, so the new militant atheism, and then chapter number two, what is religion? Because I would argue that the new militant atheists, the reason why they're so passionate about their beliefs is because they're as religious as we are. Sometimes they're more religious than we are. And, um, but they have a, you know, if I say God exists, everybody would agree, well, that's a religious statement. So then how come when the atheist walks in the room and says, no, God does not exist, how can that not be a religious statement? If I affirm something and somebody else negates my affirmation, they haven't changed the subject. So the statement, there is no God, is as religious of a statement as the statement, there is a God. Okay? By the way, if we say that, no, you have to believe in God to be religious, then all traditional Buddhists, including Buddha himself, was not religious. Because Buddha doubted that God existed and didn't even think it was relevant. So, uh, so whatever the case, these guys are slamming us. They're saying, well, you guys are religious and all religion is outdated, and they don't even realize how religious they are. That's why on the cover of The Atheist Illusion, I had the cover artist, Bill Herod, or I think one of the world's greatest artists, um, I had him put Charles Darwin in stained glass. And so the day that that book became available on Amazon.com, the day it was released, I got three or four zero ratings from atheists slamming the book, and there was no way they could have read the book. They could have ordered it, but it would take a few days to receive it. So they just looked at the cover on Amazon.com and just freaked out. And these are guys writing books, God is not great, how religion poisons everything, the God delusion, saying all this nasty stuff about us, and then it turns out they've got pretty thin skin themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, all atheists are not, there's a lot of atheists that are not the new atheists, that are not real militant. Some atheists are very respectful to Christians, and um, they're not the new atheists. So. All right, well, God bless you, uh, and God be with you as you go home.